Hey, I finished building my experimental mandola. I was a little bit worried because this whole instrument was an experiment in two major respects. First, I built an exponential horn into the internal body structure. That's why I call it a horndola. And second, I used a neutral tension bridge configuration with absolutely no bracing on the soundboard. And I think both experiments worked. First, I'll summarize the specs and show some photos, a couple of sound files, and then talk about the experimental aspects. The scale length is 17 inches. The soundboard's made from uh, bear claw Sitka spruce. Sides are curly maple. All the binding is bloodwood with some black-white purfling. The back is quilted maple. The neck is curly maple with a wide bloodwood center strip. Uh, the fingerboard and peghead plate are snakewood with bloodwood binding. I made a cover for the brass tailpiece, held on with three small magnet pairs. And uh, you can see a small string damper I slid in there, made from a thin slice of curly maple. And on the back, I made a plate to cover the four mounting holes for the neck bolts. And that quilted maple plate is held on with two magnet pairs. Okay, I'll go over uh, some of the specs in a little bit more detail and then talk about the experimental aspects of this whole thing. So the strings are set up conventionally for a regular mandola. Four courses of two strings each, each pair tuned in unison as uh, C, G, D, and A. And you can see that there isn't any sound hole or any F holes in the soundboard. The only port into the body is actually the exit port of the internal horn that I'll talk about a little bit later. The, that curly maple bulge at the upper left is an armrest that's bolted onto the outside of the body so that nothing is hanging over any part of the soundboard. The fingerboard and peghead plate are uh, snakewood with bloodwood binding and some black-white purfling. You can see I used a zero fret configuration instead of a standard nut. The peghead has a pyrotized fossil ammonite set in against a circle of gold mother of pearl. The fingerboard top and side fret markers are gold mother of pearl. And I use Rebner tuners. There isn't a truss rod, but there's a quarter inch by five eight, eighth inch thick carbon fiber rod incorporated into the neck that uh, makes it really stiff. And there are four barrel bolts in the base of the neck. And I use those to bolt the neck onto the body through four holes in the back of the instrument body underneath that secret magnetic plate. Uh, the back is quilted maple, epoxied over structural carbon fiber plate that, um, that I'll talk about also in a minute. Note the armrest there again, you can see it at the lower left. Uh, the sides are curly maple, epoxied again over structural carbon fiber that I built the internal horn from. So what's this horn that I keep talking about? Well, you can't see the horn from the outside, 
the only part you can see is the exit port of the horn, which is that crescent-shaped hole in the side of the body in the top image here. The horn itself is built into the body of the mandola. So the real questions are, what the heck is an exponential horn, and why would I want to build one in? So the best thing to do if you're really interested is to check out horn loudspeakers on Wikipedia. Basically, an exponential horn is what is called an acoustic loading structure that should increase the efficiency of coupling between the soundboard and the air in the instrument body. The end results should be greater amplitude, a better bass response, and a flatter output spectrum relative to uh, an identical instrument without the horn. And by flatter output spectrum, I mean that there will be fewer extreme peaks and valleys in the sound spectrum, so a better balance across the instrument's full range. A lot of fancy speaker cabinets have built-in exponential horns. So here's a classic naked exponential horn example. It's an SG Brown exponential horn radio speaker from 1923. I got this image from worthpoint.com. So this whole horn and driver setup is a really good analogy for the horndola. Uh, this is a backloaded configuration. I think the speaker cone here is facing down and the small end of the horn covers the rear hole in the driver magnet. In normal usage, the thing would be mounted so that both the horn and the speaker would be radiating out into the room. Uh, for the horndola, the soundboard is equivalent to the speaker cone. The front of the mandola soundboard is still radiating sound out away from the instrument, but I added a horn to the rear of the soundboard. The side port in the mandola's body is equivalent to the big flared mouth of the horn in that previous image. It is not like the side ports that are currently getting popular in guitars. This one isn't simply a hole in the side of the standard body, but something totally different. So here's what's going on. The overall outline of the mandola body is based on a logarithmic spiral. Again, check Wikipedia for a logarithmic spiral. So the internal chamber of a three-dimensional logarithmic spiral, like a conch shell or a nautilus shell, is actually an exponential horn. Uh, so that's why the mandola is shaped kind of like a seashell, and also why I decided to use a fossil ammonite as a peghead decoration. I designed the body as two chambers stacked on top of each other, separated by a stiff internal sheet of carbon fiber that has a small hole in it that's going to connect the two chambers. The top layer is an empty chamber about an inch deep. It's essentially just a rim for mounting the soundboard. The bottom layer is three inches deep and is constructed to be the logarithmic spiral horn itself. This is easier to understand from the images I took during the construction. I started out by drawing the shape of a logarithmic spiral at the appropriate scale onto paper cutouts that would be the shapes for the bottom and the intermediate plates of the instrument body. Those templates were stuck to a 1 8 inch thick carbon fiber sheet that I got from Dragon Plate and then cut out. I then crafted a curved three inch tall ribbon of carbon fabric to follow the shape of that spiral. And uh, the spiral ribbon was then epoxied onto the base plate and the internal carbon fiber sheet was epoxied onto the top of the spiral ribbon so that the spiral was captured between these two plates. These shots show the final internal structure along with the internal support braces. The four big tubes at the pointy end are the tubes that the neck bolts will go through, and the two tubes at the round end are the support sleeves for the tailpiece posts. You can see the small shell-shaped hole that will be the only coupling between the upper and the lower chambers. I used carbon fiber fabric and epoxy resin to cast the sides for the body. This stuff is actually pretty easy to work with, and there are lots of really good videos on the web that show how to cast stuff using these materials, so I won't show any of the details here.
The cast sides were then glued onto the internal structure to surround and enclose the spiral ribbon between the bottom and intermediate plates. So that epoxied fabric became the, the structural sides of the Horndola body, which I then later covered with three thirty seconds of an inch thick curly maple veneer. This is the final form of the internal structure before I mounted the external veneers and soundboard. Uh, the purple spiral line you can see indicates where the spiral ribbon is located below the intermediate plate. You can see that the sides project an inch above the intermediate plate, and that's the empty upper chamber that will be the mount for the soundboard. Three carbon fiber plate sections have been epoxied around the four bolt holes at the front of the structure, and that's where the neck is going to be bolted on, and will totally seal the upper chamber around the neck base when the soundboard is mounted. The two carbon fiber tubes just inside the rear will be the sleeves for the posts that hold the tailpiece, and the two whitish blobs at the lower left of the structure are blocks of maple that have been epoxied onto the intermediate plate inside. Those blocks have embedded uh, quarter 20 thread inserts and will be the mounts for the armrest. Uh, the shell-shaped hole near the center of the intermediate plate is positioned right above the tightly curved origin of the spiral ribbon sandwiched between the two plates so that the uh, air movement caused by activation of the soundboard is coupled down into the lower horn chamber at that location. So you can notice a bunch more holes in the intermediate plate that weren't there before. One more round hole near the center shell-shaped hole and a bunch of smaller ones in a spiral pattern centered in the open area within the uh, lower spiral chamber. So those are all the result of over a hundred, like a bazillion acoustic tests I ran to determine if there were any bad resonant nodes that I could eliminate. So uh, think of it, the spiral horn itself would be optimized for a particular set of notes, kind of like a bugle. By putting extra holes in along the horn structure, I figured I might be able to defeat the limited intrinsic tuning and theoretically smooth out the response spectrum. And that actually worked. Here's a sample set of 15 or so different spectral measurements showing a wide range of effects of plugging different holes on the, uh, that had on the low frequency into the spectrum. And this is plotting the response from 50 hertz to 500 hertz along the bottom axis and the relative response amplitude on the vertical axis. So I narrowed down the configurations to um, the best set and just picked one of them that seemed good. So here's the final configuration before installation of the soundboard. The air chamber extends through the center hole and wraps out along the spiral of the exit port. Here's the underside of the soundboard with absolutely no bracing. All you can see are the two aluminum brad hole T-nuts and thin carbon fiber washers needed to mount the bridge. And here's the finished body after installation of the soundboard, ready to have the neck bolted on. Okay, one final note about the neutral tension bridge configuration. Here's a shot of the bridge and tailpiece without the tailpiece cover. The, uh, the posts supporting that tailpiece actually come up through the soundboard without touching it, so they don't put any stress on the soundboard itself. So this final pair shows side views of the assembly. Note that the break angle of the strings behind the bridge is zero, so the bridge is putting no tension and no torque onto the soundboard. So how can this work? Well, a brilliant guy named Richard Toon, T-O-O-N-E, figured it all out and actually patented the idea. It's just absolutely brilliant. So I think what's happening is the strings vibrate up and down. They're pulling up on the soundboard as much as they're pushing down on it. To make this work, you need to do two crucial things. You have to attach the bridge to the soundboard, and I do that with small nylon bolts, and you have to attach the strings to the bridge. Otherwise, the strings would just rattle up and down against the bridge. And I do that with a titanium rod that I shaped from quarter-inch titanium stock, screwed down onto the strings above the bridge assembly. So since there's no string tension on the soundboard, no soundboard bracing or arching is needed at all. 
so the mass of the soundboard can go way down. You can make it thinner. And the board itself uh, is the only thing that's vibrating when you pluck the strings. So this contributes to the increased volume, flatter spectrum, and it actually extends the response spectrum up to higher frequencies in relation to configurations that have a normal tension bridge. So there you have it, the Horndola. So you should uh, try building one yourself out there. It'd work for anything, mandolin. I'm gonna try it next, I think, on a guitar, see what happens there. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching.